Ladies and gentlemen of the Ocean Liner Designs community, it is your friend and resident ship nerd, Mike Brady here, to answer uh, a few of the questions that you put through on Patreon. Thank you so much for sending some of these through. Here we go, first question. Prince Eugen, if you had a time machine go on a round trip voyage on any liner, which one would it be and why? Uh, Prince Eugen, because I know you and I know um, what ships you're interested in, I know you're going to like the answer to this question, but uh, I can pick the Ocean Liner, I can pick the year, and I can even pick the voyage. Um, that probably would have been uh, Queen Mary's final voyage in 1967, just when she was sold to Long Beach, and uh, it just looked like it was a giant party the entire time. I know maybe the Mary was a little bit past her prime, but the atmosphere on board would have been incredible. There would have been some real characters on board at the time, so that would have been fantastic. So I, I could pick any time or place, 1967, Queen Mary. Ah, that's one down. 2,000 more to go. Aiden Why Not says, hardest aspect of drawing old ocean liners. Without a doubt, hands down, the hull plating. These ships were incredibly complex, especially in the stern. If you look at pictures of the Lusitania or Olympic or, you know, any liner of that era, there's just so many things going on. So you've got these plates intersecting and going all over the place and it's a complete nightmare. Um, very difficult to track. There are hardly any plans for this kind of thing, even on famous ships and it's really not fun to try and figure that out. In fact, I'm doing it right now for the Lusitania game that uh, Tom Linsky and HFX have been working on, um, mapping the hull plating and the strakes and the plates for the Lusitania, and that has been a, uh, a, a nightmare. Airwicker says, does your skill extend beyond ships? Have you drawn other non-ship items? Yes, I can actually really draw anything from the side. I'm really interested in ships, but I've drawn buildings. Another huge area of interest of mine is aviation, and I would love to do aviation profiles, Spitfires and, and Messerschmitts and all that kind of thing. But it's so saturated, and there are hundreds of people doing it, not many doing this kind of ocean liner work. So that's mainly why I stick to ocean liners instead of aircraft, because it's kind of been done. Rainhill, 1829. Hello, Rainhill. Rainhill says, recips or turbines? So Rainhill's asking me which Propulsion method for ships do I like better? Reciprocating engines, those big old steam engines you might be more familiar with from the likes of Titanic, or the turbines, which you would find on ships like Queen Mary and her ilk. Rainhill, I'm gonna give you a cop-out answer. If I had to pick one to power a ship that I designed, I would of course pick turbines because they are extremely powerful. They can drive your ship at great speed, um, extremely efficient, great choice, love them. For pure emotion, however, there's something about reciprocating steam engines. I know you're a man who loves steam-powered things, so you can understand this more than anybody, but turbines are fully encased in a shell and you can't see any of the blades or any of the workings. You can hear them, they're very loud, but you can't see it. Reciprocating engines, however, I mean, surely we all have seen the 1997 film, which shall remain unnamed. There's something so cool about having these open, casings, seeing the workings of the engine, the pistons driving. Um, there's something really uh, evocative and romantic about that whole era. So truly astounding. I love seeing them. But if I had to pick one for a ship, it would be turbines. If I had to uh, pick one for my house, if I could install one in my living room, for whatever reason, to power my fridge, <laughs> it would be reciprocating. Ogoji says, how many hours does it usually take to do a drawing in total, i.e. research of designs and blueprints? Really good question, because the drawing is almost like the easy part. Um, like I said earlier about the shell plating, the hard part is sitting there looking at photos and uh, crying because you can't figure out the whole plating plan of a ship. <laughs> so I actually use two screens. I've got a big screen behind my laptop and a smaller screen. And the big screen has the reference material on it because I need to see more stuff. And the little screen has the drawing on it, not the other way around. So in answer to your question, um, if a liner takes like a hundred hours, maybe, I think Titanic took about a hundred or 150 hours plus, the researching would take up uh, maybe a half at least of that time thing. So it, it's, a, it's a huge process, but the drawing is almost like the easy part. NZ, question the first, favorite trans-Tasman ship? I'll bet you saw this coming. I did. And question the second, the ship you are most looking forward to drawing? Ah, right, good, good questions. Okay, first one, favorite trans-Tasman ship? There's a very quick and easy answer for this one. It's the Awatea. Um, she was just eye-achingly beautiful, both on the outside and the inside. So she was built and launched in 1936. Um, she was uh, Vickers Armstrong built and sailed down across, obviously on her, um, I guess her maiden voyage, but her delivery voyage 
to um, to New Zealand Sydney service. The interiors are un just stunning and deco and the exterior as well. She's beautifully balanced. Um, in fact, just over here, in fact, you know what? I'm, let's, let's take a little, uh, let's go walk about. Okay, we are doing this live. In fact, I, um, I love the Awatea so much that in the office that I've set up here, I have posters relating to famous Australian liners and liners on the Australia run. And uh, over in the corner here, a poster of the Awatea. Isn't she beautiful? And then Orient Line. We've got the Aberdeen Commonwealth. Orient again behind a giant model ship. That's a whole other story. <laughs> Shaw Saville, which is one of my favorites, the Dominion Monarch, the old bucket of blood, massive favorite of mine. And uh, again, Orient. Whew, okay. How did you enjoy the field trip class? <laughs> uh, what ship am I, lo <laughs> what am I most looking forward to drawing? Um, there's no one that I'm most looking forward to drawing, to be honest, but um, probably a mix or, or a tie between the Oriana, which I love, and I know a lot of you guys love as well, the QE2. The QE2 is a ship that I have a personal connection with. I also have a connection with the Oriana. I'll tell you about that in a second. And um, probably the Queen Mary 2 as well, actually. The QE2 and Oriana I have a personal connection with. Um, Mum sailed to New Zealand in the 70s on Oriana and it made a huge impact on her and she, she absolutely loved it. So I'd love to draw that ship, that Australian connection again. And the QE2. The QE2 is very special because she used to visit Melbourne quite a lot and we lived right on the waterfront um, facing Station Pier. And she would turn up and I tell you what, we would always go out, Dad and I, and we'd stand on the pier and watch QE2 come in. She'd be blasting her horn. And it was really, I realize now, quite a special evocative moment because, I mean, she's been retired for a while now and you won't be seeing that again anytime soon, sadly. Chick Vicious says, have you ever watched the show Tugs? Believe it or not, I have uh, actually checked it out a couple of times. It's good fun. If I had to pick a Tug, that was my favorite, it would be Top Hat <laughs> because he is hilarious. Sunshine! Only good for day workers here. Might brighten you up a bit, Top Hat. <laughs> I resent that. Ainsley says, five questions, five questions we have here, ladies and gentlemen. Number one, what in your opinion has been the most revolutionary advancement in maritime technology and maritime regulations? So in particular, have there been any advancements that would not seem remarkable at first glance, but have snowballed into something much greater? Great question, and there have been a few. I'm pretty sure the ice patrol that was established in the wake of Titanic sinking and then a lot of the procedural changes for, for liners um, transatlantic liners at the time was huge because that must have been like the Wild West and Titanic certainly wasn't the first liner to have a, a close scrape with an iceberg um, so it was always like left to the captain's discretion and even though at sea of course the captain is in charge I think they have to play within the rules. Technologically speaking though it, it certainly has to be the uh, the advent of wireless at sea what a what a absolute game changer that is if you try and imagine what it would have been like beforehand if you read about shipwrecks like Eric the Red um, or Lockhart or any any great shipwreck pre-1900 where they would fire off rockets and hope for the best. You imagine there's no other way to signal a nearby ship except for, you know, your Morse lamp or flags um, or rockets. So the wireless telegraph changed everything. The ability to communicate with shore. And so I think that, that has got to be the biggest technological advancement since. Number two, what is the stupidest ship-related conspiracy theory that you have ever heard told in earnest? <laughs> uh, there are uh, whole books literally dedicated to the, the switching of Titanic and Olympic. And this is like the bane of my maritime historian existence because it's just such bad history. It just ignores basic facts, um, you know, basic truths. It drives me nuts. And I, I, I can't state this enough, but I literally get almost, you know, 10 comments a day on videos, especially my, what happened to Titanic. <laughs> I just switched them around myself, especially on my, uh, what happened to Olympic after Titanic sank video. 
where the comment will always say, don't you mean what happened to Titanic after Olympic sank? Drives me nuts. Number four, do you believe you would have taken an interest in ships if they never sank? Or if just the Titanic never sank? Yeah, that's an interesting question because the Titanic story is what really drew me into ships. 20,000 kilometers away, 100 years on, passionate passengers still pack the Titanic. Sort of like a, a famous fairy tale now, it just, it holds the imagination. The ballroom dancing. 17-year-old Michael so infatuated, he drew this Titanic tribute, accurate, right down to bolts and rivets. How long did it take? Upwards of 200 hours. Over the years I've drawn hundreds of drawings of the ship and I wanted to do something that would really uh, knock them all out of the water. If you'd asked me five years ago, or more even, about other ships from history, I wouldn't have been that interested. There's just something about the Titanic story that, that seems to grip us all. Is a ship only interesting because it sank? Definitely not. You know, um, there have been some legendary ships out there that didn't sink and I'm as interested in them now as I am in the Titanic. But if Titanic never sank, would I have become a, a, a ship nerd? Probably not. And it was studying the Titanic's construction and books like Titanic the Ship Magnificent and On a Sea of Glass that really taught me a lot about the way that all ocean liners are built. Because if you can understand how Titanic was built, you can understand a lot of the concept behind Queen Elizabeth's construction or, you know, even further forward, QE2. A lot of the concepts are the same. So as soon as you can get your head around that, you can understand all ships. So I think Titanic is like the gateway drug, <laughs> for want of a better term, for ship nerds. Number five, are you tired of answering these questions? No, no, never. Oh, definitely not. Okay, here we go. Uh, Jamie Bosado. Hi, Jamie. Jamie says, I'm back with another question. Which ocean liner book did you enjoy the most and what books of ocean liners would you recommend? Well, as you guys know, I have an entire library of books behind me and I kind of want to do a video just talking about the books that I've got sometime because I feel like you guys would, uh, would appreciate and enjoy a lot of these books. Yeah, I've talked about this before, but um, the entire series of biographies that Sir James Bissett did about his time with the Cunard line are, are just really interesting, just totally fascinating. I think the first one was called Tramps and Ladies, the second one Commodore, and there was a third one. I don't know if it came last or first, but I've got two of them and they're, they're just brilliant reading. So if you can get your hands on a copy of any of Sir James Bissett's autobiographies, absolutely do, because he became a the Commodore of the Cunard line. So he's got some, some stories from his life at sea, that's for sure. Yeah, there, there's a lot more. There's a lot more that I could go into. I, I might do a, a video dedicated to this. Spider-Man, the amazing Spider-Man says, what ship has caused you the most pain to draw? She's not a liner, but uh, she was a warship and that is the HMAS Sydney. And I have mentioned this before uh, to a lot of you on the Patreon Discord, but warships take three times as long to draw as ocean liners because they're just covered in equipment. You know, there's guns and radar and all kinds of stuff sticking out at weird angles and there's stuff everywhere. HMA Sydney was a lot of effort, um, a lot of pain. But you know what they say, no pain, no gain. Alexius says, number one, JVO video win. Haha, <laughs> JVO, one of my favorite ocean liners of all time. JVO being the shorthand abbreviation for the ship's actual name, which was the Johan van Alden Barneveld which is a great name for a ship. I will do a video on the Johan van Alden Barneveld, but I want to draw it first, you know, so I can show you around because the design of that ship was insane. There was windows in weird places and promenades everywhere, and I'd love to do a video on that, but uh, maybe maybe when I draw it. Sean, or is it Cian? I'm still not sure. No, I'm just kidding, it's Sean. Number one, what kind of crayons do you use to draw your ships? Only red ones. Number two, what's your least favorite ocean liner? You guys know this about me. I love all ocean liners almost equally. For some reason though, there are some that just don't really grab me as much. And I have to say that the Ball and Trio, I know they're epic. I know their design is fascinating. From an exterior standpoint, I just think they are extremely Teutonic, designed purely to inspire awe because of the size and scale of them, but they look super industrial and they, they don't really do it for me. 
Number three, what's your favorite place to go to for ocean liner history or want to go to for ocean liner relevance? Belfast, Southampton. So um, in 2018, I actually did go to Belfast and that for me was really special. Walking on the Nomadic was great because I hadn't been on a lot of museum ships by that point. So seeing the way that she was built and the frames and, and the rivets and everything was like one of the first times I actually got hands-on experience with a with a uh, you know uh, with a liner, she's a miniature liner. Let's let's be real. One of the really cool things about Belfast is when you're walking along the uh, the riverfront, heading towards where Harland and Wolf used to be located. There are these big inset brass markers along the track with all the different names of different ships, and there are like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of names, and so that was really cool. And where would I like to go next? I would love to go and film at the site of Mahino's wreck. Um, I know a lot of you guys are obsessed with the Mahino. So I would love to go and, and actually film there and maybe make a video for you guys. <laughs> so until then, as always, stay safe and stay happy. And I'll see you again. This has been a lot of fun. Let's do it again sometime. <laughs>